and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derbs alike. Welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike with us, Paddle Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you the season finale of Creepy Gaming. That's right, folks. All good things must unfortunately come to an end. But I figured what better way to go out, what bigger bang to blow up on than Five Nights at Freddy's 4. That being said, we've already covered the initial game. We have covered the Five Nights at Freddy's 4 Halloween DLC. We've even briefly talked about FNAF World. But today, it's the show you've all been waiting for. Today, we will be covering none other than secrets, theories, and Easter eggs from Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. Alright, it's time to get to the main course of this mill, so let's dig right in. As usual, I am not claiming in any way that this is all of the secrets, theories, and easter eggs of the series, but rather a mixture of the most discussed and my personal favorites. So let's start with a creepy easter egg and all the theories that surround it. One of the more discussed and more fascinating easter eggs of the game can be found in the child's room while playing. Occasionally, when turning around to look at the bed, you may see one of three things. Either flowers, a prescription pill bottle, or even an IV drip. These easter eggs have led to a ton of speculation. There are many theories as to what these items could possibly mean. As I mentioned in my first Five Nights at Freddy's 4 episode, we don't even know for sure if this is the same kid we see in the Segway scenes between nights. We assume it is, but we don't know for sure. If you want to get technical and get into semantics, which is what we do here on this show, then you'll notice that the child's room in the Segway scene only has one door, whereas the kid's room here has two. Not just that, but where are his plushies? You know, as friends. All we see at night is the plush Freddy, while in the Segway scenes he has a golden Fredbear. Huh. Now, when I first played, I just assumed this was the same child, until I realized the room layout was different. This is where it gets more bizarre. Maybe it is the same kid. We just might not be playing the nights leading up to the party as we originally thought, but rather afterwards. Allow me to explain. There's been an interesting theory going around that we are, in fact, playing as the same young boy, but after the incident, and that you're really on your deathbed. We know the boy was already afraid of the animatronics as it was, but once bitten, he sees them as he remembers them, as nightmarish monsters. Or the poor kid's just seeing shit as some sort of dying hallucination. Spoilers, but if you look at the ending of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, we assume the child eventually dies. So were we playing the last week of his life? If this theory is in fact true, then it would explain why at times we see the IV bag or the medication on his nightstand. The flowers would be a customary get well soon gift, or even a new stuffed teddy bear. Sounds like it could be a plausible theory. But what do you guys think? You tell me. So this Easter egg can be easy to miss, but between nights two and three, you were in a Fred Bear's pizzeria. You were supposed to walk to the left, but if you turn back around immediately, you will see the purple guy assisting someone in a bonnie suit. Many players, myself included, found this to be interesting. 
To me, this says that the purple guy, who we associate with the killer from the previous games, was in fact a Fazbear employee. There has been a theory going around for well over a year now that the purple guy and the phone guy were actually one and the same. This may further prove that theory. This isn't really an easter egg as much as it is a follow up. More of a nod than anything. Last year when I covered the first Five Nights at Freddy's, there was a theory regarding the ominous cupcake. Why? I have no idea. Anything can be picked apart in these games. So whether it was planned from the beginning or Scott Cawthon just wanted to add it because of all the fuss, in this game, the cupcake does appear for the first time as an attacking animatronic. Probably the most debated of all the easter eggs and theories would be that of the TV ad. Between nights 3 and 4, the young boy must walk home from Fredbear's. Upon arrival, if you go to the TV, a commercial will begin to play showing Fredbear and Friends, copyright 1983. So it's possible what we thought was the bite of 87 might not be after all. Personally, I don't know. I could see both sides to the debate, but I'll admit the timeline confuses me in this game. This is supposed to be around the time of the first restaurant, Fred Bear's Family Diner. I was under the impression that the only two animatronics there were Fred Bear and Golden Bonnie, which makes sense because in the game we only see the two in the actual diner. My question though is why are we seeing all the other animatronics? Maybe I misunderstood something with the original characters. Maybe Foxy and Chick were around or something. But that is no excuse for Toy Bonnie. Why do we see Toy Bonnie everywhere in this game? The young girl in the field with her toys. Even the mysterious commercial we see. Toy Bonnie! Again, maybe I'm missing something really big but I didn't think the toy versions of the animatronics were made until 1987. Wasn't that like half of the plot of the second game? The grand reopening? The new toy animatronics? If I'm missing something, please let me know. Again, I see both sides. I could see how many think it's the bite of 87, and I could see how, because of the copyright date, some think it to be a separate bite entirely. Personally speaking, just my humble opinion, I don't know. I can't help but feel this is a red herring from Cawthon to throw everyone off. Just because the commercial says 1983 doesn't mean that was the year it aired. Maybe, just maybe, they copyrighted the name four years prior when the company started. Maybe they were advertising a new location with new toy animatronics. Here's my last argument and then you can fight amongst yourselves in the comments section. Why wouldn't this be the bite of 87? It's never been fully addressed. Besides, if this really is the final chapter, which I doubt, why would Scott Cawthon create an entirely new story arc? It just doesn't make sense to have two bites. Toy Bonnie is the key that proves that this game does, in fact, take place in 1987. Boom! There's my case. You can't see it right now, but I'm totally dropping the mic. Alright, the last thing I want to do right now is to make a lame, overused, what's in the box joke. That reference is in fact nearly 20 years old now, and seeing as this game has been out for months, I'm sure it's been used. That out of the way, let's discuss the strange box at the end of the game. At this point, we should all know about the box. There are two locks, and as of right now, no way of opening them. The text above it reads, Perhaps some things are best left forgotten. For now. To me, if this really is the final chapter, then this is a fitting end, and allow me to explain why. 
Go back and watch my first Five Nights at Freddy's videos. I've been saying it for a while now. Scott Cawthon has always given the players room to speculate. That's the magic of the series. Each game, Scott has raised new questions without giving definitive answers, leaving room for theories and speculation, something I think has truly attributed to the game's popularity. This installment finally wraps it up, for the most part, while still being vague enough to question. Think about it for a second. Whether we realize it or not, the story arc of the five missing kids was explained in the last game, the purple guy was revealed to be an employee and eventually the killer. We learned in the last game that the marionette was the one who placed the kids in the original animatronics. And as far as I'm concerned, we saw the events that surrounded the Bite of 87. The main storylines are wrapped up. Now sure, there are many cryptic aspects that we can tear apart and over-examine, but we finally got some closure. Or at least as much closure as I think we're gonna get. For now. The box is Scott's way of leaving with one last trick up his sleeve. If he decides to never come back to the series, then it's left open-ended. And I assure you, whatever you imagine is in that box is better than what was intended. Again, that's part of the magic. And like any good magician, you never reveal all of your tricks. If Scott does decide one day to return to the series, then he's got somewhere to go. Another smart move on his part. So with all of that being said, yeah! Whether you like it or not, Five Nights at Freddy's has done more than enough to earn its place in creepy gaming history. Well, I guess that's going to do it, folks. I think that does it for Season 5 of Creepy Gaming. It's been a fun ride, but again, all good things must come to an end. I want to thank you all so much, everybody. If you just started watching this week, if you've been watching years ago since Season 1, I would like to thank everybody for watching and supporting season five of Creepy Gaming. It means a lot to me, it means a lot to my family. So it is greatly appreciated. Most importantly, guys, enjoy your time with friends and family. That's what this is all about. As far as me and season five of Creepy Gaming goes, I think that's gonna do it for us today, folks. I wanna thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I am Mullen Mike with Paddle saying keep Stay creepy. Thank you all for watching. Peace.